I have to admit, it's hard to hear today's gospel reading without taking it personally. Beware of the scribes, Jesus warns. But according to reliable sources, the scribes were educated people of the time who were experts in God's written word. They interpreted the scriptures and taught them to the people. They were the religious professionals of their day. If you were looking for the religious professionals of our day, you might look at seminary professors, but it is far more likely that you would look at people like me, preachers. Beware of the preachers, Jesus would say, standing down there and pointing up here. They like to walk around in long robes, and you know that's true. At my last church, it was the custom for the preacher to wear a long robe. And I liked it. I didn't have to think about what to wear on Sunday morning. I would just go to church, put on my robe. And even those preachers who don't wear robes regularly seem to enjoy it when they get a chance. You should be here for one of the seminary commencement exercises that we hold. When the preachers are down in the choir room, putting on robes and hoods that they haven't worn in more than a year, blowing the dust off those fancy caps and putting them on and trying to make sure the tassel is hanging on the right side. You can tell just by looking. They enjoy it. Beware of the preachers, Jesus would say. They like to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces. He's right about that too, although it rarely happens these days. I saw a recent survey indicating that ministers rank only slightly above used car salesmen in terms of the respect they receive from the public. Of course, it depends on where you serve. In Washington, I didn't get much respect for being a Baptist preacher, but in Richmond, that's changed. These days, people nod to me and say hello in the grocery store. Sometimes they say, I watch you on television. And occasionally, but only occasionally, someone will offer me a ministerial discount. (laughs) I don't know about you, but to me, nothing says respect in the marketplace like 10% off on your dry cleaning. (laughs) Beware of the preachers, Jesus would say. They like to have the best seats in church and the places of honor at banquets. And that hardly seems fair. I don't get to choose my place in church any more than the organist does. Becky has to sit over there on the bench and I have to sit over there in the penalty box (laughs) with the other ministers. That's just the way it is. And it's the same at banquets. You have to sit where the place card tells you to even if it's at the head table. There's nothing you can do. You certainly can't go and sit in someone else's place. Beware of the preachers, Jesus would say. They devour widows' houses and for the sake of appearances say long prayers. Devour widows' houses. I'm not even sure I know what that means unless Jesus is talking about that time I asked a former church member if she would will her house to the church so that we could fund an annual lectureship. But I asked her to will it to the church. I was going to wait until she died. But she was a widow. She was. And the thing about long prayers, that's just a matter of expectations. When I go to someone's house and they ask me to say the prayer at dinner, They want something a little more than God is great, God is good. I mean, I'm a professional after all. I've been to seminary. They want a prayer that is tailored to the situation, something beautiful, dignified, appropriate. I try not to let them down. Beware of the preachers, Jesus would say. They will receive the greater condemnation. And he's right about that. When I was installed at my last church, I wrote up a long list of my intentions for my ministry there. Right at the bottom of the list, I said, I intend 
to work like I don't need the money, to love like I've never been hurt, and to dance like nobody's watching. It was a line from a country song. But when my brother-in-law, Chuck Treadwell, stood up to preach at my installation service, he said, you'd better do that because the only alternative is to work like you do need the money, to love like you have been hurt, and to dance like everybody's watching, and that is no way to work or love or dance. That was true there, and it's true here. And let me just say to you this morning that if I ever get to the place where I seem to care more about the way you look at me than the way God looks at me, I would deserve whatever condemnation might come. And all joking about 10% discounts aside, if I ever begin to use my position as a way of enhancing my privilege, then I hope someone would pull me aside and say, Jim, beware. It's happened too often among preachers. Jesus was right to warn you. It's just after that that he sits down opposite the treasury and begins to watch the way people put in their offerings. And if I have felt uncomfortable up here in the pulpit while he was telling you to beware of the preachers, it's your turn to feel uncomfortable as he walks up and down the aisles of the church to see what you put in the offering plate when it comes down the pew. Mark says that there were a lot of rich people throwing large sums into the treasury. As I understand it, it was a kind of strong box that had a big brass funnel coming up out of the top of it, shaped like the bell of a tuba. These rich people would dig down into their money bags, pull out a big handful of coins, and then when everybody was watching, they would throw those coins against the bell of that tuba so that they made a loud clanging sound, rattling and clunking down into the bottom of the strong box. It made a big noise. Everybody would turn and look, which is just what they wanted. We've pretty much gotten away from that kind of show these days. We put some cushioning in the bottom of our offering plate so that even when a child does throw in a big fistful of quarters, you can hardly hear it. And the big givers are far more discreet. They put their offering envelopes into the plate so quietly, you can't hear a thing. Not until later, at least when you walk by the finance office and hear one of our tellers say, wow, look at that. Isn't it interesting, though, that for all the supposed secrecy of our giving, we all know who the big givers are? Or at least we think we do. We know who has the big money. We've seen the trappings of wealth. We have whispered in the hallways. But as long as I've been in the ministry, I have made it a point to never know what individuals are giving. It might change my feelings about someone if I knew they had a lot of money, but only gave a fraction of it back to God. I like to assume the best about everyone. I like to assume that everyone is giving 10% of their income back to God through the church. But that couldn't be true, could it? If everybody were doing that, our finance team would not have to worry about how to meet the budget, but what to do with all that money that was coming in. I told you recently that evangelical Christians give approximately 2.4% of their annual income back to God through the church, but I was wrong about that. It's lower than that. I find that hard to believe, especially because 30 years ago, Baptists were battling for the Bible. And some of them were saying that if you didn't believe it was inerrant, you didn't believe it at all. Imagine my shock to learn that some of these same people are now giving only slightly more than 2% of their income back to God. 